forward to this. Today, in less than one hour of your time, you and I will make a Beyond game together. A brief introduction first. I'm a member of Grind Knight's development team, and I've been around Beyond since 2006. On more than one occasion, I decided to learn how to code, and then I quit. Our purpose as a team is to make sure that you, the new Beyond programmer, find success where others have failed. This video is our new approach to getting you started with the fundamental principles of DreamMaker. It'll be geared toward people with little programming experience or those who just have no experience with the DreamMaker language. DreamMaker is a language designed specifically for creating multiplayer online games. It has built-in networking and graphics support. This makes it the best language for new programmers who want to make games. If you've not already installed Beyond or Visual Studio Code, please watch that short video first. It'll be linked in the description, along with Grind Knight's Discord and the DreamMaker reference page. In DreamMaker, Atom is the base class for all visible game objects. It's an integral part of the object-oriented hierarchy in the language. The other classes, Area, Turf, Object, and Mob, are all derived from the Atom class, inheriting its properties and methods. Every visible game element, areas, turfs, objects, and mobs, is an instance of the Atom class, or one of its subclasses. Atoms have common properties like name, icon, icon state, and location. An area is a subclass of Atom that represents a distinct section or region within the game world. Areas are typically used for organizing game space, defining properties like lighting, ambiance, and environmental effects. Examples of areas might include rooms, outdoor zones, special locations like a safe zone, or a boss arena. A turf is another subclass of Atom, and it represents the basic unit of the game world's grid. Turfs are used to create the game's floor, walls, and other terrain features. They act as a foundation upon which other game elements are placed. Examples of turfs could be grass, floor tiles, or water. The object class is a subclass of Atom that represents in-game objects. These objects can be items, equipment, furniture, or any other interactive element that players can manipulate within the game world. Examples of objects might include weapons, potions, keys, or vending machines. The mobile, or mob for short, is another subclass of Atom, and it represents mobile entities within the game world, such as players, NPCs, and creatures. Mobs are typically capable of movement, interaction, and performing actions. Example mobs may include players, monsters, or friendly NPCs. These classes form the foundation of DreamMaker's type hierarchy, providing a structured way to define, organize, and interact with the various elements that make up the game's world. We're going to begin this tutorial with you already logged into the pager. Let's click on the cog wheel and select Start DreamMaker. File, New Environment, and we'll come up with a name for it. The first code file, or DM file, can share the same name. While we're here in the default editor, let's make an icon file. We'll call this icon file player, because the player does need an icon when moving around the map. Double click this top left cell, or click the plus sign. We won't be spending much time doing art, but I will show you the basics here. Here at the bottom of the editor, you can see that this down arrow indicates this is the south-facing icon state. But let's say we wanted our player to face four directions. Now we have the ability to create different states based on which direction the player is facing. The player's icon will now change when in the game, dependent upon the direction that he's facing. But if we want this icon to move while the player moves, we're going to need some extra frames of animation. Just to give you an example, I'm only going to move these states up and down to animate them. Now if you mouse over our icon here, you can see that it's moving. Unfortunately, this is going to move even when the player is not moving, so there is a simple fix to that. Double click on the name of the state and select Movement State. This means this icon will only be animated when the mob moves. This concept is illustrated more clearly with a legitimate player icon. This entire project will be available for download in our Discord, including these icons. For now, let's navigate back to our code and we'll compile the save. When you compile the code as we just did, the editor will go through and look for errors to make sure that it can actually execute the code that you've written. And with this first step done, I'd like to open this project in Visual Studio Code. Here's the project in Visual Studio Code, and as you can see, all projects have some presets. Let's take a minute to organize our files before we get started here. 
We've just created new folders into which code files, icon files, and map files can be placed. We don't have any map files yet, but we will need those soon. For now, let's think back to what we were discussing about Atom, Area, Turf, Object, Mob. And for the time being, we'll make a code file for each one of those. In the DM reference, which again will be linked in the description of this video, let's navigate down here to World. We see Procedures and Variables. We want to look at World variables. One variable of World is Mob. This page tells you all about World's Mob variable. But for now, all we need to know is that when a new player connects to the game, they are given this Mob. With that in mind, let's define World's Mob variable here. Because we want to differentiate players from other types of entities in the world, we need to make a special type of mob. Player seems like an appropriate name, but this can be anything that you like. It could be this, it could be this, or it could be this. For the sake of simplicity, we'll leave it as player. Now we've declared that when a player logs into the world, their mob will be the mob player type. But this mob player type is not yet defined in our code, so that's the next thing we'll need to do. Back inside our mob.dm file, you can see that we've cut mob and step size from its original file and pasted it here. You'll notice that I also renamed the original file to world.dm. This is because the world type is currently defined there. Remember, all DreamMaker code files must be given the .dm suffix, or they will not be read by the compiler. Now we need to define that special mob player type. We've just defined player as a type of mob. And because mob is an atom, it has access to the icon variable. Therefore, our player icon will be defined here. This is a great opportunity to talk about some of the errors you may run into and how to fix them. First, you can see we're getting this error for inconsistent indentation. Oftentimes this can happen when you paste in part of the code from somewhere else. If you look closely, you can see that step size is indented with an arrow, while player and icon are both indented with dots. What this means is that this portion of the code is using spaces rather than tabs. To fix this issue, we'll go to View, Command Palette, and start typing in the word Convert. Now you can see the dots have been replaced by arrows. This is what proper indentation will look like. Now when we compile, we're getting another common error that can happen. The terminal is indicating to us here that the player.dmi file is only found in our resources. This is because the project does not know to include the icons folder. Oftentimes, to fix this and other issues, just open the project in the default editor. Once I compile here and go back to Visual Studio Code, you'll see that folder will be included. But here's another common occurrence. These checkboxes indicate which code files are included in our project. Unchecked files get ignored when you compile. You can see here that our object.dm is not included in the project. To include it, just click the checkbox. Now we'll compile. Since we have no errors and no warnings, let's go back to Visual Studio Code. And you can see straight away that now Visual Studio Code, even without compiling, is including this icons folder. Visual Studio Code offers many conveniences over the default editor, but it is important to be aware of its shortcomings. Without any further delay, let's define some areas for our project. I'll write out our area parent here indented all the way to the left. That's our A in Atom. The theme of our game today is going to be a gym. For that reason, I'm going to define an area called Exercise Room. And without giving Exercise Room any variables, I'm going to define another area called the Spooky Area. You'll see why shortly. Next, just like we defined area, let's define some turfs. Remember that while area defines what zone we're in, a turf visually represents it. We'll call this turf Floor. Although, again, it could be called anything. And our floor turf is going to have the icon of floor.dmi. Now this icon does not exist yet, but it will. If we compile, you'll see that our terminal tells us floor.dmi does not exist. Cannot find file. Go back to your project folder and let's go into icons. We'll take this icon and we'll just copy it. I'm going to rename this floor. Since this is not a floor, we're going to delete both of these. You can make your floor any color that you want, but I think I'm going to make a wood floor. I expect that in my world, eventually, there will be many different kinds of floors. 
For that reason, I want to specify what this is. What I've done now is assigned a name to this icon state. Let's go ahead and compile. And we'll go back to Visual Studio Code. Now if we compile here, you'll see our errors are gone. But remember, we gave a name to the icon state of that floor we just made. Therefore, we're going to define a new type of floor under the parent floor. Since this version of the floor is called wood floor, we're going to give it our icon state wood. Since this wood floor is a child of the parent floor, we're going to specify that its icon state is wood. The way this code is read is that we're defining a turf called floor. All floors have the icon floor.dmi, but only the wood floor, which exists inside of floor, has the icon state wood. Now we're going to compile this and make ourselves a map. To make a map, navigate back to the default editor, select File, New, Map File. Map files have the extension .dmm. We'll call this the gym. Here you can select the size of your map. For the purpose of our project at the moment, 50 by 50 by 1 should be sufficient. You can always add new map files later. As you can see, our map is totally blank. We need to fill it in with the wood floor. Remember from the code, wood floor is a child of floor, and floor is a child of turf. Here you can see that visually represented. This should be enough floor for now. Next, remember that we made two areas. We made the exercise room area, and we made the spooky area. These areas don't have icons, so they won't be seen, but we can still define where they exist. We'll say that this is the exercise room, and we'll say that everything else is the spooky area. Go ahead and compile again. At this point, you can press F5 to launch the game. You'll see that our player spawns in on the very bottom left of the map, and that our wood floor is here. Our wood floor isn't very pretty though, so we're going to import a different graphic. We've imported a new graphic here for our floor.dmi file. Unfortunately, its icon state is named the same as our previous icon state, indicated here by this red warning, duplicate. We'll go ahead and fix that. Go ahead and compile again. And if we launch the game again, you're going to see that immediately, without even touching the map, our floor has been updated. As you may have noticed, we're already able to move around in the game without even having coded any custom movement. That's because move is the default procedure of all mobs. It doesn't need to be defined anywhere. But it may be the case that when designing your game, some mobs should not be able to move under some conditions. We're going to create our first custom variable and we're going to assign it to mob. A variable is something that's used to store data. In this case, the data that we want to store for all mobs is a variable called can move. If it's true, we allow the mob to move. If it's false, we do not. By default, we're going to allow all mobs to move, unless otherwise specified. This alone does not do anything yet. Remember previously we discussed how all mobs have a built-in procedure called move. Visual Studio Code offers us the convenience of being able to control click this move word. By doing that, you bring up a DreamMaker reference. This is the same as the website that I previously mentioned was linked in the description of this video. Here you can read all about the move proc, but for now, all we want to say is if any mob is attempting to use this move proc, they can only do it if their can move variable is true. This is an if statement. Anything within an if statement will only execute if the things within the statement are true. In this case, we are asking if the mob attempting to call the move proc can move, if can move is true. Writing it this way is the same thing as writing it a couple other ways. If can move is equal to true, or if can move is equal to one. These are things we'll cover in greater detail in a later video. For now, just know this if statement is asking, can this mob move? Inside this if statement, we're going to put this, which calls the parent move proc and allows the mob to move. 
we are not limited by the number of things that we can put inside an if statement. If there were other things we wanted to put inside of this statement, we could do that. Adding comments to your code is a convenient way to help you remember what it does. Generally, it's not good practice to comment every line of code, but since we're learning, it's acceptable. Thus far, we've added things to area, mob, and turf, but we haven't done anything with objects yet. Our gym is going to need some exercise equipment, so let's go ahead and define that as an object. Just like we did with the floor being a child of turf, so too is our exercise equipment a child of object. That means that exercise equipment has access to the icon variable. Again, this icon does not yet exist. We're going to add it. I'm sure you're getting sick of seeing me go back and forth between Visual Studio Code and editing DMI files. For that reason, I've gone ahead and added all of the icons that we're going to need for this project. For the time being, there are going to be two different types of exercise equipment in this gym. The first one is a treadmill, and the second one is a barbell. Both the treadmill and the barbell are children of exercise equipment, which itself is a child of object. That means that treadmill and barbell each have access to all of the variables and built-in procedures that exercise equipment and object have. Just like the wood floor, we've given our treadmill an icon state. Note that while icons are wrapped in single quotations, icon states are wrapped in full quotes. Our barbell, unsurprisingly, has an icon state called barbell. Next, I want to make sure that players can't just walk over treadmills and barbells. Objects are dense, and the object atom has access to the density variable. This is a built-in variable that tells the game that this object is dense. It cannot be walked over. By putting it here, I'm saying that all objects that come after this have this density of 1. This means that all exercise equipment has a density of 1. I do not need to define it down here. Let's compile this code, Control shift b and we're going to add our exercise equipment to the gym. In the map editor, we'll find our exercise equipment under the object tree. After we've added the equipment, and while we're thinking about it, let's move our map file into the map folder that we made previously. Now run the game. As you can see, we are not able to walk over or under these objects. They are dense. We need to be able to use this exercise equipment. So we're going to assign verbs to each the treadmill and to the barbell. A verb is a special procedure that can be executed by a mob. That could be a player or an NPC or an enemy. We can call this verb anything we like, but for the sake of simplicity, we'll call it use treadmill. The treadmill itself is not able to access or use this verb. This verb is used by mobs. Inside of use treadmill, we're going to write this. We're going to use the set directive to modify this verb. SRC, or source, is the object instance executing this verb. In this case, it's our player. We're checking to see if this treadmill is in O view one of the user. O view is another built-in proc of DreamMaker. You can read about it here. Basically, what O view is doing here is returning a list of objects in the distance that we specified here. In this case, we're checking to see if the treadmill is within one distance or one tile of the user. Now, we're going to create a custom procedure called exercise. Remember how we discussed that move is a built-in procedure for all mobs. A procedure is a named sequence of instructions that performs a specific task. Procedures help you modularize and organize your code, making it more readable and reusable. In the case of our custom exercise procedure, we want to define what is being exercised when we use the treadmill. We're going to say that when you exercise with the treadmill, you're going to train your speed, but we need to define who is calling this proc. By prefacing it with user, we're saying that the user 
or the mob who calls this verb on the treadmill will then call the exercise proc for its speed. But speed is not something that exists yet. Let's fix that. Remember how we set this custom variable here for all mobs called can move. We're going to make a new variable called speed. By default, we'll say that all mobs have a speed of one. Next, we need to actually define what our exercise procedure does. Exercise is going to be a procedure that belongs to the mob. To make a new procedure, write proc. Within this proc, we want the name of our procedure, exercise, to match what was previously written. As you can see here, exercise is the same as what we've written here, but we've included speed within these parentheses. This is called an argument. An argument is a value passed to a procedure or a verb when it is called. In this case, our argument is a string called speed. On this end, that passed argument can be represented any way that you think is appropriate. But because exercise is going to increase our stats, I'm going to call this passed stat. Think back to our if statement from before. If the if statement is true, it will execute the code within the statement. Here, we're checking the value of past stat. If that past stat is equal to the string speed, then the speed of the source or the entity calling this proc will increase by one. A convenient way to check if the code within your if statement is being executed is to put a world output. This line says that the world, that is all clients that are logged into the game, will receive this output. Our output is a string. It says speed increased for source. If you notice, I have source in brackets. That's because I want to display the value of this source. We're going to launch the game and use the treadmill. You can see that when I come within one tile or one distance of this treadmill, I get the use treadmill verb. On clicking it, I get this output here. You can see this does not say SRC, but it says my name. The fact that we received that output tells us that this if statement was true and that all of this code was executed successfully. Now we're gonna pick up the pace a bit. I've added a new verb here under barbell called lift barbell. It does the same thing as use treadmill, but instead of increasing your speed, it'll increase your strength. Mobs have also been given a strength variable to account for this. We're not going to make a second exercise proc here. We don't need to. Instead, we're going to write a switch statement. A switch statement is just a more efficient way to handle a series of if statements. To temporarily comment out this code that we're not going to need, control forward slash. And under this exercise proc, write the word switch. In its parentheses, pass stat. Our if statements will go inside the switch statement. Now, because we have two stats, we're writing the switch statement to check for which stat is being exercised. Now we're checking the stat that's been passed in through the exercise proc. It should be impossible for any mob to call the exercise proc without a stat, but just in case, let's put a little error message here. Now, if for some reason a player ever calls the exercise proc without a stat, they'll get this message. Next, we're going to add a stamina variable for mobs. By default, stamina will be 100. What we'd like to do is use the stamina stat to determine whether or not a player is able to exercise. Now what we've done is we've said that if the player's stamina is less than 10, they get this message, you're too tired to exercise. The return keyword breaks out of the exercise proc. If this condition is not met, then the next thing that happens is the player's stamina is reduced by 10, and then they exercise the appropriate stat. While we're in here making player variables, let's do another one. Think of the exercise cooldown as a little break between sets. 
You can't just continue to exercise back to back. Therefore, when the player exercises, we'll set their exercise cooldown variable to a number that is equal to world time plus 50. Time is a variable kept by world, and all we're doing is adding 50 to it. In this case, 50 comes out to 5 seconds. But this cooldown is not yet doing anything because we're not checking to see if a player is able to exercise. To do that, let's go back up here, and we'll write another if statement, similar to how we did with stamina. Now this condition is checking if the player's exercise cooldown is greater than the world time. Remember, we're setting the exercise cooldown to the world time plus 50 any time the exercise is successfully executed. For the sake of consistency, we'll change this user to source. And we're going to add another message down here. This message outputs directly to the source or the mob that calls the exercise proc. If we successfully exercise, we're going to tell the player that their past stat, remember that's the string coming in through this argument, increased to this value here. This value is the variables belonging to the source named the same as the past stat. Let's run the game and see how this looks. You can see on the first use, my speed increased to two. But now I'm getting this error message. You need to rest before exercising again. Your speed increased to three and so on and so forth. This code is working as intended, but remember, anytime that you need to debug your own code, you can do a world output or some other output that would indicate whether or not the code is being called. Since I no longer need this code, I'm going to remove it. Next, we're gonna need a way to recover stamina. Otherwise, we'll reach a point where we can't exercise anymore. Let's make a new mob proc here called Regenerate Stamina. And we're gonna tell this proc to do one simple thing, If the source, or the mob, that is calling this proc, if its stamina is less than 100, then its stamina is going to increase by 1. Naturally, if the stamina is already 100, it will not increase. Now we need a way to make sure this happens slowly over time, rather than quickly. What we're doing here is using another built-in proc called spawn. Spawn takes a number as an argument. In this case, we've given spawn the number 10, which translates to one second. The way spawn works is that it waits the duration before it executes code within it. But it does not wait to move to the next line. If we had anything else below spawn on its same line, that code would execute immediately. But anything within spawn, including this regenerate stamina proc, will execute only after one second has passed. This code will regenerate one stamina every one second. While we're talking about stamina, let's give ourselves some supplements. I'm going to navigate back to the object code file and make us a new object. This new object will be a vending machine. And out of the vending machine, we're going to purchase creatine. Creatine will help with stamina. Similar to the verbs with treadmill and barbell, we're saying that only players, in O view of distance 1, can use this purchase creatine verb. The verb calls a get creatine proc, which does not yet exist, but we'll make it exist. We're still under the mob proc tree here. You can see that in Visual Studio Code by collapsing lines if you'd like to. This makes it very easy to see where we're working. Mob is at the highest level in this code file, and proc is directly under mob. Under proc, we're creating our new procs, such as exercise, regenerate stamina, and now get creatine. But actually, how can we get an item if we don't have an inventory? Let's make an inventory. A list is a special type of variable that lists more than one item within it. Because we may want to have multiple items in our inventory at some point, we're going to make the inventory a list. 
This inventory is a variable that belongs to all mobs. Now let's come back down to our get creatine proc and think about what we want it to do. The way that I would like this to function is that if you already have creatine in your inventory, you cannot get another one. If your mind went straight to an if check, you're tracking. Now this proc is successfully checking whether the player has creatine in his inventory. If that is true, he will get this notification and return will break him out of the proc. Now we have to write some code for if that if statement is false, if you do not have creatine in your inventory already. If you said, we'll add the item to the inventory, you'd be correct. These little notifications are not necessary, but it does let us know that our code is functioning properly. Now all we need to do is add the vending machine object to our map. To do that, let's compile the code. And in the map, we'll just find our vending machine. Well, it looks like we did something silly. Vending machine is not exercise equipment. So let's fix that. Let's go ahead and compile to save the map. As you can see, based on this indentation, vending machine is a child of exercise equipment. I don't want that. To move your entire selection left, shift tab. This is another great opportunity to look at an error that you might receive. This error has to do with the map file. You can tell because the DMM over here is red. What happened is that we moved the vending machine from being a child of exercise equipment to being a child directly of object. Therefore, there is no longer a valid path for the vending machine object that we previously placed on our map. How do we fix it? Let's navigate back to the folder where the map file is. You can see that when we open the map, we have a pending map error. This tells us there's something wrong with this item on the map. To fix this error without removing the object from your map, go ahead and just change the path. We already know that we moved vending machine over so that it's no longer a child of exercise equipment. Therefore, this is the new valid path. As you can see, our vending machine is here and there are no issues. Now let's try to run the game. As I approach the vending machine, you can see that I get the verb for purchase creatine. Alternatively, I can right-click the object itself and access the verb that way. I got some creatine, which is great, but we can't do anything with it yet, so let's fix that. We're going to navigate back up here to the mob player path, and we're going to do a couple of things. If you recall, we made a regenerate stamina proc, but the proc is not being called. Ideally, this is a proc that we want to have run continuously when a player is logged into our game. In order to do that, we'll initiate the proc when the player logs in. Login is another built-in DreamMaker proc, and although it can't be clicked from Visual Studio Code, you can look it up in the DM reference. What we're saying is that when a player logs in, that player will call the Regenerate Stamina proc. This proc, by its nature and the way we wrote it, will run continuously. Now we're going to give the player a verb. We're going to give him a way to use the creatine that he got from the vending machine. Often when you're writing code, it's good to think about how you'd like the code to work in plain language and then translate it into the code. The extension called auto comment blocks will come in handy here. This is an extension that we previously recommended in the Visual Studio Code video on this channel. This extension makes it very easy to write multi-line comments. Now anything written in here, the compiler will ignore. That gives me the freedom to think about how I want this verb to work. I've now written out some plain language with how I'd like this verb to work. Now all I need to do is convert it into code. Remember what we did with the exercise cooldown timer. I've done the same thing here with creatine, but it's a little bit longer than five seconds this time. The only problem is this variable does not exist yet.
Currently, the way this code is written is that it's implied that the creatine cooldown belongs to the source or the mob calling this proc. But for clarity, I'm going to add source here anyway. Just know that these three lines here will work without source, but it is a helpful way for you to learn. This is a good time to discuss source and user. The source is an object that is currently executing the code. It represents the object whose method or verb is being called. User is a variable specific to verbs and refers to the player's mob who initiated the verb. In this context, both source and user will work, but I want to use user so that you can more clearly understand what it is. As you create more complex code, the user and the source will be different. For that reason, it's important to understand this distinction. You can read more about user and source in the DM reference. Let's create some other fun verbs while we're already in here making verbs. How about one to choose name? There are a few things going on here. First of all, name is a default variable that all atoms have access to. Since mobs are part of atoms, then our user, who is a mob, has access to the name. Input is another built-in proc, and it takes several arguments. The nice thing about Visual Studio Code is that it shows you very clearly all of the arguments that input and other procs will take. Input takes a user, a message, a title, and a default. You can read more about each one of these arguments in the DM reference, but just know that we're using this to create a pop-up in which a player can select his username. Our first argument is the user, followed by the message, and then the title of the pop-up. Whatever the user types into the pop-up will be assigned to that user's name. Two more important verbs while we're here. This is another verb that generates a pop-up in a different way. It's going to take the argument T in the form of text. Then, for all mobs within range 5 of the source, or the user of this verb, they're going to receive this string. The string says that the source, or the user, says T. Again, T is our argument here, and it's text. This would be a way for you to communicate with other players in the game, but it's currently range limited. This is a verb called yell. Its intention is going to be to communicate a message to all players in the game world. We've written world outputs before, so you should already know what's coming next. Instead of outputting to mobs within view 5, we're now outputting to every client in the world. These strings can also take HTML. So just for fun, let's make this yell bold, because if we're yelling something, surely it's important. We're going to run the game and try out all these new toys. For now, it seems that everything is working as intended. Now that we have several new variables, I'd like to see them in-game. Stat is a proc that belongs to the client, but since we know that our player has a client, we're able to use stat. When we log in, this will display these variables in-game. Now, let's make sure that we can save and load our variables. Here are two new player verbs, save progress and load progress. We'll be making a video specifically on save files in the future. But for now, just understand that write and read are the core components of saving and loading progress in a Beyond game. Both of them are predefined global procs, and the argument they take is a save file. I understand if this doesn't immediately look intuitive to you, but Grind Knight's Discord is full of helpful content creators who are happy to answer your questions. Speaking of global elements, we're going to add something else that may be critical to an online game. Back in the world.dm code file, which we haven't touched since the beginning, we're going to add something. When written in this way, with ver at the highest order, we're saying that this list player list is a global variable. When players log into the game, we want to add them to that global list. In the same place that we're initiating the regenerate stamina proc, we're also going to add the source or the player to the global player list. That way we know who's online and who's not. Speaking of which,
Before we proceed, let's log in and test our stat panel and our save and load verbs. It looks like saving and loading are working properly. We've been paying a lot of attention to the player mob, but let's make a different type of mob. We've just defined a new type of mob for the world, but we know that the player cannot be this mob because this is not a mob player. This is a mob NPC. Specifically, it's a trainer NPC. Let's add some fun dialogue for this NPC. That's quite a lot of text, but rather than explain to you what each one of these arguments does, I'd rather show you. We're going to compile and open the map one last time. The alert proc is similar to the input proc in that you get text and a title to your pop-up, but unlike the input proc, the alert only gives you buttons that you can press. In this case, we have our three buttons here, which reflect the text that we typed out earlier. Currently, they don't do anything. If you remember the switch statement we used earlier, we're going to do the same thing here and change the behavior based on your selection. Uh-oh, we don't have anything to put in these parentheses. What are we trying to switch? There's an easy fix for that. Let's make a local variable and call it response. Now, the button you press in response to this alert pop-up is stored as a variable called response. So we're going to switch response. Now we have our three possible responses, but there's nothing inside any of these if statements yet. Let's take care of the easy ones first. Now we have our responses when we select just some encouragement or never mind. But I want this NPC to be able to give the player a quest. Our quest is going to be cleaning dirt off the gym floor. Now within this dialogue, we're given more options. Presumably, we'll be able to select yes or no. And different things need to happen based on what we select. So just like above, we're going to make a new local variable. Now we have a new alert. The text is, do you want to accept the quest? The title of the pop-up is cleanup duty and your options are yes or no. Now we're writing an if statement to check and see if you selected yes for accept quest. Now we have some user output for when the player selects yes and accepts the quest. They are given some basic information on the details of the quest we don't actually need to check and see if the player clicked no. If written in this way and you select no, the pop-up will simply close. Now having said that, this quest has absolutely no functionality yet, so we're going to change that. First of all, we need a dirt spot to clean up. Let's go back to our object file here. And just below vending machine, on the same level, at this point, you're already familiar with adding new objects to the game. You may not be familiar with this variable called alpha. Alpha is a variable between 0 and 255 that determines an object's transparency. More accurately, it determines the transparency of any icon. At an alpha of 150, the icon for our dirt spot will be a little over 50% opaque. Now we need a way for the user to clean the dirt spot. Delete is a built-in function that will delete an object, as you would imagine. In this case, we're telling it to delete the source, the source being the dirt spot. But actually, the delete proc is not very efficient. In almost every case, instead of using delete, you're going to want to set the location of the source to null. Location is a built-in atom variable. When you set it to null, you've effectively deleted the atom. As an aside, this is a great example of source and user being different. This is why it's important to understand the distinction between the two. 
So we've given ourselves a way to clean and set the location of the dirt spot to null, but we haven't actually spawned it in yet. To do that, we're going to type new object dirt spot. This is the correct path for our dirt spot, which is a child of object. But if we set the location of dirt spot to null in order to delete it, that means that an object is going to need a location to exist in the first place. Locate is another built-in proc. It takes an X, a Y, and a Z coordinate. If we run the game now and accept this quest, we should see the dirt spot spawn. As you can see, we successfully cleaned the dirt spot, but again, there's no further functionality to this quest. Also, I noticed that our dirt spot was dense, and I don't want that to be the case. In this file, we've said that all objects have a density of 1. For dirt spot, we're going to override that. In the same way that you don't have to repeatedly define density of 1 for any child of object, you can also override the default density by defining it under a specific object. Now we need to think of a way to complete this quest, and how it's going to work. I'm going to do the same thing I did before, and write it out in plain text first, and then convert it to code. So now I have a rough idea in plain language of how I want this proc to work when I complete the quest. At this point, the biggest question is how to determine whether or not I've cleaned the dirt. I think the best solution to this is a temporary player variable that keeps track of whether or not you've cleaned dirt. What I'm doing here is defining a temporary variable. Temporary variables are not saved in the save file when you click save and they are not loaded when you load a save file. What this means is that if you clean dirt and then you log out, you no longer will have credit for having cleaned that dirt. But for the functionality of my game, I think that's okay. Another thing I'd like to track is how many quests I've completed or how many times I've completed the quest. This is not a temporary variable, meaning that when I save and load file, this variable will be represented there. I want quests completed to increment by one every time I complete a quest. So let's go down here and make a new verb for this NPC. The first verb we have up there is talk. The new verb is going to be called complete quest. Remember, we need to check if the player has cleaned dirt. It's important to set the dirt cleaned back to zero after having completed the quest. Otherwise, a player can continue to complete the quest over and over. Now let's write a condition here if the user has not completed the quest. I sure don't like lazy bones and neither do you. Now, if you try to complete the quest without having completed the quest, you're reprimanded. I'd like to see a visual representation of our completed quests, so I'm going to add that to the stat panel. While I'm up in this part of the code, I'm remembering that we made a global variable called player list, and that we add the player to it when he logs in. Now, I want to be able to look at the player list. This is the first time that we've used four. 4 is a useful tool in DreamMaker and can be used several different ways. We'll go further in depth about 4 in a later video, but just know that for now, the way that we're using 4 is this first example here. What we're doing is we're looking for something in a list of things. 4 variable mob i, i just being a designation, in the player list, which is our global list, output i to the user. Now we'll try to keep track of all these changes we made and we'll launch the game. First of all, let's check those online players. This seems to be working. Uh oh, it looks like we forgot to increment our clean dirt by one when we clean the dirt. Luckily, that's an easy fix. Let's go back to our dirt spot object. When we clean up the dirt, we need to set the user's dirt cleaned variable to one. The next time we attempt this quest, it should work, but let's do a couple other things first. In the very beginning, we set up these two areas, but we haven't done anything with them yet. 
I'd like to show you some of the functionality of areas. The most basic functionality I can think of is a user output to indicate what area you're in. Entered is a built-in proc. It takes two arguments, but we're only going to use the first one, which is an object. In this case, it's the mob. What we're saying is that once the mob, designated M, enters this area, he'll receive this output. Despite this, these areas are still not impacting our gameplay. Let's change that. We're going to create a new mob proc. What we're doing here is reusing some tools that we've used in the past and combining them with new ideas. Previously, we used for to check for something in a list of things. Here, we're using for to check an area designated A in range zero of the source location. Range is similar to O view, which we've been using, but range can also look at the tile on which the player is standing. What we want to know is what type of area the player is occupying. Therefore, we're checking the range zero of the source location. Because we want to use this check area proc as a tool to see what area the user occupies, our only goal here for this proc is to have it return true or false. In this context, the past area is the type of area that we'll be asking for elsewhere. This will make more sense here momentarily. On this line, all we're doing is checking if the type of our area is equal to the past area. And if it is, we're returning true. So how does this work? Suppose we want to disable the ability to talk while in the void or the spooky area. What I want to happen is when the player uses say in the spooky area, nothing happens. Now, when a player uses say, it's going to call the check area proc, and it's going to pass in the argument area spooky area. If this comes back true, then nothing will happen. Let's try it out. First of all, we need to check and see if we can complete this quest yet. It looks like the change that we made to the dirt spot object allowed us to complete the quest successfully. Now let's walk into the spooky area. First of all, you can see that we have an alert here now. You have entered the spooky area. Nothing happens. If I use the save verb in the spooky area, I only get this return. Nothing happens. Let's add a couple finishing touches here. Previously, we defined a cooldown for creatine use, but we're not actually checking the cooldown. Now the user's creatine cooldown variable is actually doing something. There's one more thing I'd like to show off in this project before we get going. Here's some code that I've pasted in from my practice run of this project. It uses a handful of things that we haven't covered yet. First of all, we made a can move variable at the very beginning of this project to determine whether or not the mob is able to move, but to this point we haven't used it yet. Here, we're going to say that when you're lifting the barbell, you are not able to move. This code is also making use of animate, which, as you would imagine, is another built-in proc. It takes these arguments. We're not going to cover animate in its entirety in this video, but we will in a follow-up video. There's a lot to be said about animate. Let's add one last thing here, and then I'd like to show off what animate is doing for us. Layer is another variable that belongs to Adam. Here, we're saying that the layer of this barbell is the mob layer plus one, which means if the barbell and the player occupy the same tile, the barbell will overlap the player. First of all, let's check this creatine code. It looks like our creatine cooldown is working. Now, let's get over here and lift this barbell. We hope that this introduction to DreamMaker has given you the confidence to continue your journey toward mastering this language. I'm certain that each one of you has a passion project that you want to see come to life, and it can happen with a little practice and support. Join our growing community at Grind Knight's Castle, and don't let the opportunity for growth pass you by. The source code for the project in this video will also be posted there if you'd like to look it over. And lastly, if you find our videos helpful, Drop a like and share them with a friend. This is how we'll rebuild beyond. Drink water, stay youthful, 
and turn your weaknesses into your strengths. Until next time.